What are the real goals of U.S. military intervention in Niger? The first time most Americans even heard of U.S. operations in the West African country was when a group of U.S. Army Special Forces were ambushed during a patrol on October 5, 2017. The ambush near the village of Tongo Tongo was the deadliest incident for U.S. forces in Africa since the 1993 Battle of Mogadishu. As a result, the American public was both confused and outraged at the lack of information about U.S. military missions on the African continent. This prompted a series of congressional inquiries and a Department of Defense investigation. These have had long-lasting consequences that reach all the way to the events unfolding in Niger today. The reports ended up blaming the individual soldiers and lower levels of command, instead of the higher-ups taking responsibility. So what really happened in Niger? Why was the Pentagon accused of lying about the incident? Was there a CIA cover-up? And why were there over 800 US troops in Niger in the first place? What American interests were they really protecting? I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Let's analyze that. Niger is a large landlocked country in West Africa. It's home to over 25 million people. 80% of the country is covered by the Sahara Desert, which means most of the population live in the Sahel. The Sahel is a narrow band of transitional desert, savanna climate along the south that crosses through Niger and its neighboring countries. The dry landscape and frequent drought make for a harsh environment. This has led to the country having the unfortunate distinction of ranking highest in the world on UN Poverty Index. Niger is a former French colony that gained independence in 1960. But government instability, corruption, and ethnic division made for a rocky 50-year period. This all culminated in a military coup in 2010 that returned the country to some semblance of a parliamentary democracy for a period. But first, I want to tell you about the brand that made this video possible, Ridge Wallet. When they say it's the last wallet you'll ever need, they really aren't messing around. And that's because these wallets are made from premium aerospace grade aluminum and backed by a lifetime guarantee. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been wearing the Ridge Wallet watches in the videos for the past few months and I absolutely love them. And with plenty of colors and variation to choose from, you won't need to skimp out on style to take advantage of their super sleek minimalist designs. Be sure to check out the wallet and key case combo. It securely holds one to six keys and prevents your keys from jiggling. You can get up to 30% off your order when buying the Ridge Wallet and key case together. Ridge Wallets hold up to 12 cards plus room for cash, and they've sold over 3 million wallets and have over 50,000 five-star reviews. And the Ridge team is also sure you're gonna love it because they're gonna allow you to have 99 days to test drive it. So head over to ridge.com slash task and purpose and use code task and purpose to get 10% off your order. That's ridge.com slash task and purpose, promo code task and purpose to save 10% and a few extra inches in your back pocket. US military involvement in Niger stems from the global war on terror and the international fight against ISIS. It truly kicked off with what was called the 2002 Pan-Sahel Initiative, formed shortly after the 9-11 terror attacks. U.S. Department of State said that this was, quote, a state-led effort to assist Mali, Niger, and Chad in detecting and responding to suspicious movement of people and goods across and within their borders through training, equipment, and cooperation. This initial agreement didn't see any U.S. troops on the ground. In 2008, the U.S. consolidated their organization and created what's called United States Africa Command, or AFRICOM, that was responsible for maintaining military relations with 53 African nations. The stated goal was to counter terrorism and grow democracy in the region. However, in 2011, when the U.S. government helped overthrow the dictator named Gaddafi in neighboring Libya, this left a power vacuum that created instability in Niger. There was an influx of arms and weapons pouring through their over 340 kilometer long border. On the other hand, I have to say it's not entirely fair to lay the blame on the United States because the unrest and civil war in Libya was brewing long before U.S. intervention. Possibly in response to this, in January 2013, the U.S. and Niger signed what's called the Status of Forces Agreement under President Obama. This allowed U.S. troops and aircraft to operate in Niger in a non-combat capacity. This non-combat mission was focused on supporting French counter-terror efforts in neighboring Mali. At the time, it was suggested that the move was a way to smooth over the rift between U.S.-French relations after France had criticized the Iraq invasion. In any event, this 2013 agreement meant that for the first time in my short memory, there were over 100 U.S. troops and Predator drones deployed inside Niger. But the mission grew, 
In June 2017, President Trump told Congress, as required by the War Powers Resolution, that the number had increased by more than sixfold. The president of Niger was reportedly happy to have the American soldiers present helping with security in the country. So at this point, between 600 and 800 US Special Forces operators were in Niger. The official word out of the Pentagon was that their job was to quote, advise and assist, which could mean a lot of things, but advise and assist doesn't sound like kick in doors and take names. However, the New York Times got an anonymous source that said Special Forces personnel had been out on quote, reconnaissance patrols with their Niger counterparts at the time. The mission had slowly creeped into a combat capacity. The advisory role can quickly become an active combat one. In fact, between 2015 and 2017, American personnel were quietly involved in at least 10 firefights and had already been ambushed while operating in Niger, eliminating 32 enemies. However, since no Americans were killed or wounded, it barely made for news. No one in American public paid attention to or really knew about the rapidly growing mission in Niger. And then we see in 2014, the US military footprint in Niger grew even bigger when the government granted approval for the $110 million airbase called Airbase 201, located in the city of Agadez. It would take several years to complete though, but once it was finished, it would have a 6,800 foot runway that would allow for the C-17 Globemaster to land. This aircraft could easily fly in heavier armored vehicles like the MRAP. I think it was this logistics difficulty that could have led to the lack of armor in the country. Part of the reason for this mission creep was because this was the time period that I like to call the US Special Forces Renaissance. It was the SF Enlightenment. It was operator elevation. American SF units grew from 38,000 personnel in 2001 to 73,000 two decades later. Its budget grew from a tiny 2.3 billion to 13.7. And for some very good reasons, right? Because these operators were showing the best results on the battlefield. Why wouldn't you double down on what worked? The DOD didn't have to risk deploying large numbers of troops. But the mission in Niger was about to reveal one of the potential challenges that SF units faced. Despite hopes for new, prosperous Niger, poor living conditions and unstable governments are fertile ground for insurgents and terrorist groups. Several jihadist groups like Boko Haram were already established in the remote parts of the country. One of the splinter terror groups pledged allegiance to ISIS and declared themselves the ISIS state in the Greater Sahara, or ISGS. All right, but why does that even matter? It's not like some low budget militias and pickup trucks were just gonna threaten the American homeland. But the key to understanding American military intervention in Niger has a lot to looking at their neighbors. Niger's strategic importance has to do with the fact that they border Nigeria. Nigeria is not to be confused with Niger. Nigeria has lucrative oil resources that the United States and its allies have been developing and exporting for decades. Nigeria is the US second largest trading partner in Africa, with two-way trade reaching 10 billion in 2019. Instability in the region would cause a major problem. So what went wrong here? The team in focus was an Operational Detachment Alpha, or ODA, from the 3rd Special Forces Group. They'd recently formed and deployed to Niger. They operate out of Kualam. ODA-3212 was positioned further north from the advanced operation base that was located in the nation's capital city. This was so they could better patrol the rural areas close to the border with Mali, thereby supporting the French mission there. Mali is believed to have massive untapped oil and gas wealth located mainly in its northern regions. France holds oil exploitation rights there. ISGS militants had been conducting cross-border attacks in the area, causing instability, which would prevent foreign investment. Another consideration was that US missionary aid worker named Jeffrey Woodkey, who was an American native, was allegedly being held hostage by this ISGS group. Jeffrey Woodkey had helped the Niger people for three decades before he had been captured earlier that year. His safe recovery was a high priority for the US intelligence services. There's a theory that a CIA operative was attached to ODA 3212, who used the cell phone tracker to triangulate their enemy's phone position. This might have been part of the reason why the team was ordered to give chase. We won't know because these parts might have been redacted from the official reports. Either way, the team requested permission from the advanced operations base to proceed to Teloa. The elite eight-man team had two regular US Army support soldiers, a detachment of 31 Niger local troops, 
and three Nigeria recon specialists along with an interpreter and intelligence contractor. The group traveled extremely light in eight all-terrain pickup trucks and SUVs that were unarmored. Only two of them were armed with a mounted M240 machine gun. The Pentagon investigation asserts that at this point, the team had mischaracterized their mission plan, stating they were only visiting Tiloa to meet with local leaders, not to hunt down the enemy leader there. This is important because this simple recon mission only required lower level approval. A killer capture mission would have required much higher levels approval that they likely wouldn't have gotten according to US government official narrative. The Pentagon alleges the team instead used a previous recon mission plan as a template for this one. The US government attempted to claim the group was acting out of hastiness or a gung-ho attitude to strike while the iron was hot and nab a high value target before he could slip away. However, an ABC News expose titled 3212 Unredacted alleges that Captain Perizzini in charge of the US operators actually protested the mission to go after the enemy leader from the start. The doc claims that Captain Perizzini knew this force was too lightly armed to try to go after the ISIS sub commander and argued the mission was too risky, but that his team was ordered to pursue the target anyway, even after the better equipped and experienced team's helicopters were grounded. Whatever the team's motivations, the enemy leader Shafo and his militants weren't at Tolo when the team arrived. The Green Berets and their partner Niger forces started to return to base, but received a new, high confidence intelligence report that the enemy leader was still nearby. He was supposedly at a location in the desert even closer to the border. The team relayed the information to command and a new mission plan was drawn up that would have the US team with more experience in direct action missions helicopter in to conduct the capture while 3212 provided support. Unfortunately, poor weather conditions forced that other Green Beret team to turn back and ODA 3212 was sent in to recon the area themselves. Drones over the target area had not observed any ISGS activity in over six hours by this point, so having ODA 3212 investigate by themselves was seen as low risk by special operators commanders. You might be wondering why these US drones weren't ready to rain down Hellfire missiles on any enemy, but they had previously been unarmed and operated in surveillance capacities only. So, with this lack of drone close air support with weapons, the US Special Forces teams traveled cross country through the night to reach the objective. They arrived on the morning of October 4th to again find no militants. But this time, they found abandoned camp supplies, warm fire pits, and a motorcycle. This was evidence the militants had been there recently. The ODA team leader, Captain Perizzoni, directed the overhead unarmed drones to pursue what sounded like motorcycles in the distance. The US and Niger group then started to return back to base, hoping the motorcycles would lead the drone to an ISGS base or supply camp and build intel for a possible future mission. Short on water and food supplies, the joint US-Niger convoy stopped in the village of Tongo Tongo on their way south. Arriving at 10.30 on the morning of October 4th, the Green Berets offered to conduct a key leader engagement with the village elder, while the Niger troops gathered water and ate breakfast. Key leader engagements like this are one of the best ways that US Special Forces build relationships with local populations and can provide great information or human as remote townsfolk convey what they see and hear in a way that's very hard to gather by any other method. You can't use satellites to get that intel. In Tongo Tongo, however, delays in gathering the village leaders meant the meeting dragged on 30 minutes longer than the team originally expected likely giving time for militants to arrive and set up an ambush. What really stands out to me as strange at this point is that there are multiple accounts of the Green Berets leaving this meeting not wearing their body armor. They likely took some of their kit off in the interest of diplomacy during this meeting. It strikes me as odd that this team of supposedly gun-ho unit getting ready to bag an ISGS leader for themselves wouldn't put their body armor on and prepare for battle with one ready to rock in the chamber. The Pentagon claims this team fudged their whole mission plan in the interest of justifying an attack on the enemy. But if that's really true, why weren't they kitted up expecting a fight? 
just thinking out loud and trying to make sense of the controversy that's about to come. It remains unknown if the delay in the village was intentional or just bad luck, but as the convoy departed Tongo Tongo towards the south at 1135, the rear vehicles began receiving fire from some woods just outside the village. With only light small arms fire from the woods, and their assigned MQ-9 Reaper drone still far to the north, the team halted to engage what they believed to be a small enemy force, while radioing to HQ they were receiving enemy fire. Convoy members donned personal protective equipment and returned fire with small arms and vehicles M240 machine guns, while the ODA team leader and four Niger soldiers moved southeast to outflank the enemy. The battle quickly escalated as the dismounted U.S. Niger convoy began receiving heavy machine gun fire, RPG and mortar fire from the woods. The U.S. Niger forces had mounted M240 machine guns of their own, but the ISGS militants had 50 caliber Dishka machine guns mounted on their technicals. The U.S. soldiers only had unarmored vehicles to protect themselves, so the convoy was quickly pinned down and had to shelter while returning fire as best they could from behind the vehicles. Gotta keep in mind, regular trucks like this provide very little protection from small arms. Bullets will cut straight through them. Captain Perizzini and his forces went on a flanking mission in the woods and started to engage the enemy from the side, but observed a much larger enemy force coming to join the battle from the east. They realized that their small force of only 46 troops was about to be overwhelmed by more than 100 militants with heavy weapon support. Captain Perizzini returned to the convoy as fast as he could to organize a withdrawal. An orderly withdrawal while in contact with the enemy is one of the toughest maneuvers to pull off in warfare, but staying put in this situation would have meant certain death for the entire convoy. Despite the chaos and overwhelming fire from the enemy, the US and Niger soldiers took turns remounting their vehicles while others provided covering fire and threw smoke grenades. Two vehicles were immobilized by the incoming fire, forcing troops to shuffle and pile into the remaining operational trucks and SUVs, delaying the withdrawal. Staff Sergeant Brian Black, Jeremiah Johnson, and Dustin Wright remained outside their vehicle firing upon the enemy with their M4 rifles and AT4 rocket launchers to cover the reshuffling convoy. The covering team members signaled to Captain Perizzini they were ready to leave with the convoy, but were unfortunately struck down by the withering fire before they could do so. Investigative reporters would later claim that the other US Special Forces teams in the area had requested at this point to go help ODA 3212 as soon as the first calls for help came over the radio. But they claim mid-level AFRICOM commanders denied each request. Anonymous operators backed this claim up and they report that they're furious that they weren't allowed to go help. As the others moved south from the ambush site, the convoy realized the last vehicle hadn't joined them after all and wasn't answering radio calls. Refusing to leave any soldier behind, the convoy stopped a short distance away and organized a scouting party to try to regroup with the missing members. But the scouting party and the stopped convoy were forced to pull back by the highly mobile enemy force as gun trucks and motorcycles quickly found their new position in the arid terrain. The convoy forces remounted as quickly as they could in the chaos, enduring multiple gunshot wounds while they gathered up every soldier before withdrawing. Captain Perizzini himself was shot and ejected from the bed of a speeding pickup truck and had to climb back in before finally managing to break contact. However, in spite of every effort to gather all the troops, U.S. Sergeant La David Johnson, a mechanic and driver attached to the Special Forces team, was cut off from his vehicle and killed in action while attempting to evade the enemy on foot. In the confusion of the second withdrawal, the remaining convoy vehicles were separated while being pursued by multiple enemy gun trucks. U.S. Vehicle 1, which included the captain and most of the remaining Green Berets, got stuck in mud at 12.33 allowing the pursuing enemy to catch up with and surround them. Believing they were done for, the captain and his ODA team members from Vehicle 1 radioed they were being overrun. They destroyed their comm sets to prevent them from falling into enemy hands, sending final messages to their families and loved ones over personal phones. The team took cover in a nearby swamp and prepared to make their last stand. At 1318, Salvation finally arrived as both U.S. drones and French Mirage aircraft arrived on scene. 
unable to safely drop their ordnance without hitting friendly troops, the French Mirage aircraft flew over the enemy in a rapid show of force maneuver, scaring and dispersing the enemy until French helicopters arrived at 1600 hours to finally recover the sheltering US and Niger troops. Altogether, four US soldiers and five Niger troops lost their lives in the ambush, while at least 21 ISGS enemy militants were KIA. However, this is where the story really begins, because controversy surrounding the ambush started even before the story hit the news. A lot of the controversy started surrounding the death of Sergeant Law David Johnson, because he had managed to evade the enemy on foot for a while. His body wasn't found until two days later by a farmer from the village, 960 meters away from the ambush site. This delay led to the conflicting reports that he'd been captured, with some defense insiders even telling Sergeant Johnson's family that a prisoner swap was being set up to recover him before the hope was crushed days later when he was confirmed KIA. Next of Kin continued to receive conflicting reports of how their loved ones passed away for months, with accounts of mortar fire being responsible, executions or other horrible details filtering to the distraught families in an information space nightmare. ISGS militants had looted the bodies of American soldiers, so it wasn't until helmet cam footage was finally recovered the following year that some of these questions were finally answered. Senators and Congress members were also asking questions about how this could happen. The incident revealed the US forces were more deeply involved in combat operations in Africa than previously thought. This led to calls to rescind the 2001 AUMF resolution that had been used by presidents post 9-11 to unilaterally justify military force in foreign countries when conducting counterterrorism missions. The AUMF remained in effect until 2023. In 2018, United States Africa Command laid out plans to withdraw around 25% of all US military forces in Africa, with around 10% withdrawing from West Africa. The US government reports also criticized their team and company level leadership for not adequately training the ODA prior to deployment, along with filing an inaccurate mission plan. Because of the team's mischaracterized mission plan, AFRICOM asserts that support assets and quick reaction forces were not prepared to move when the team came under fire. The unclassified version of the report blames the lower level soldiers mostly. This resulted in the Pentagon issuing official reprimands for Captain Perizzini, Company Commander Major Swan, and Air Force Major General Hicks, as well as the command sergeants for both team and special forces companies. While short of a court martial, official reprimands can kill your career. The DoD was basically claiming these Green Berets had gone rogue and were somehow responsible for their own deaths. It was starting to look like top level brass had forced responsibility down to the lowest levels, covering up their own failings in the process. Junior personnel looked like they were being scapegoated because in a press conference, AFRICOM Commander General Waldhauser said the team's actions were not indicative of what AFRICOM special operators do. Exactly what I would say if I were trying to save my own skin and hang my guys out to dry. Journalist James Meek claims that General Waldhauser replaced the lead investigator of the incident with his own chief of staff partway through the investigation. Yeah, I got a buddy, he'll, he'll do the investigation better, trust me. A clear attempt to tilt the results in a more favorable light for him. Finally, Secretary of Defense James Mattis heard that lower ranking soldiers had been reprimanded, but not their superiors. He allegedly erupted when that happened and he had the reprimanded rescinded, so they were no longer in trouble. The redacted portions of the official report were classified and they're sealed for at least 25 years. So unless a new review is conducted, we'll have to wait a long time to get the full story. A grateful James Woodkeep was finally freed in March 2023 after six years in captivity, but no one hears about that now. Though the US government is keeping the exact circumstances of this release a mystery. The ambush was widely condemned by the government of Niger, with the president there claiming for a moment of silence and three days of national mourning for all victims of terrorism. The chief of Tongo Tongo was arrested on October 21st that year for alleged complicity with the militants, and Niger officials that oversee the rural zone that includes Tongo Tongo have stated it's highly likely US troops were set up by at least one extremist accomplice within the village. With Mali and Niger both undergoing military coups in 2022 and 2023, they radically reshaped their governments. France and US forces have had to move or restrict their operations since then. As a result, 
The future of the people of Niger and the Sahel region looks very uncertain. Despite the criticisms and reprimands of upper US leadership about the mission plan, no one doubts the bravery of the men that fought that day. We recognize these soldiers and the unnamed for their sacrifices in the fight against terrorism and their unending mission to liberate the oppressed. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Subscribe for updates on the current coup situation in Niger unfolding now that we'll have a video on very soon. And if you have a chance, check out this video, which I think you'll really enjoy. I'll see you guys soon.